Now, to get us started, uh, I'd like to invite the panelists for the first session to come up to the stage. And I will hand the microphone over to the moderator of the first panel, Yasumasa Yamamoto. Uh, yes, Yasumasa Yamamoto, Yasu uh, Yamamoto is a visiting professor at Kyoto University Graduate School of Management uh, with years of experience at Google, Bank of Tokyo, Mitsubishi, UFJ, and other companies. He has deep expertise in new technologies such as fintech, blockchain, and deep learning. Uh, and he has written on how to understand and use those technologies in a number of many, many books published in Japanese. And he will introduce the two speakers of the first panel. So Yasu, please take it away. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Kyo, for a kind introduction. Um, hi, my name is Yasu Yamamoto. I'm uh, doing the moderator for this uh, first uh, session for, for, for this event. So I'd like to invite uh, uh, first uh, Ms. Reiko Hayashi to the, uh, to the stage. Um, she's the director and de deputy president of B of A Security Japan, Bank of America Group. Uh, she oversees the firm's interaction with regulators and the government department in Japan and is responsible for overseeing the government framework across the business. She is also responsible for driving sustainable finance client initiatives for the business. As chair of the Japan Philanthropy Committee and co-chair of the LGBT Pride Employee Network in Japan. Please welcome. Yeah, I think it's here. Yeah. Okay. Hi. The, the next morning. great uh, panelist is uh, Professor Gretchen Derry. Um, yep. She's there. She just arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully she's okay. Uh, okay, so th her background is, she's a co-founder and faculty director of the Natural Capital Project, which aims to integrate the value of nature into policy and management by providing accessible scientific tools, which includes INVEST. Uh, data and software platform used in 185 countries. She's also a being professor of environmental science, the director of, of the Center for Cons Conservation Biology, and senior fellow at the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. Her research focus, focuses on human dependence and impacts on nature and transformation. Welcome, uh, Professor Gretchen Derry. Thank uh, you. So today, yeah, thank you. So today, uh, she had uh, uh, some problem with the back pain, so she will stand at the, by the podium. So, 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 so she will start by, uh, with the, the her presentation first, around 15 minutes, and then uh, Ray has has 15 minutes, and you then start first. we do the panel discussion. Oh, okay. uh, maybe. Vice versa? Okay. Maybe vice versa. Okay, I, I will be here. Okay, good morning everybody. Thank you very much for having me today. It's a great honor to be the first speaker, uh, the first panelist today, such an inaugural uh, 40th anniversary of this center. I'm so happy and I'm so honored again. Uh, so thank you very much for introducing me, uh, Yasu. And, but let me briefly explain what I am doing here. Uh, okay. I'm going to talk about sustainable finance today. Maybe some of you have heard of uh, ESG. Maybe every day we see the word of ESG, sustainable finance, uh, green washing, so on. These days it's a hot topic across the globe. And then I have been in charge of sustainable finance around seven, eight years for now as an employee of Bank of America. But uh, please look at my a uh, brief summary. So I have been in the capital market business more than 30 years. I started working with Yas Kaneko, who is sitting there <laughs> as a, my former boss at uh, BNP Paribas. Uh, he is now uh, living in uh, uh, this area. It's a, it's a big surprise again, but anyway. So I've been in the capital markets for 30 years and I'm involved in sustainable finance. And then because of that, now I'm a board member of International Capital Market Association, which is a self-regulatory body which sets green bond principles or social bond principles, uh, which means what is green, what is social, to make clarity in the market participants. And then also uh, I work for several working groups set by uh, Japanese government 
to, uh, to promote sustainable finance in Japan. Recently, I was a member of uh, GX Transformation Council, GX Jiko Kaigi, set by the cabinet. So uh, with my experience, I like to update what's going on in sustainable finance in the capital markets, and then also uh, what's the hot topics there, and what Japan government is doing, and then what's the remaining areas to be solved going forward. ESG is evolving. Look at this chart. ESG market started in 2013. It's, it's still new market, but at the beginning, the market was very small. And then in the past several years, the market has grown quite rapidly. And then ICMA has set uh, green bond principles in 2014. And then since then, they set up social bond principles, sustainability bond principles, and so on. And the market grew around one trillion US dollar in 2021. And then last year, uh, due to COVID-19, due to the higher rate, and then also geopolitical tension, the market uh, became a bit smaller, but still it proved the resilience of the market in comparison with the conventional market. And look at the chart. Uh, the market has been uh, led by European market participants mainly, but these days the uh, US and then, Amer and then Asian uh, are also growing. And then also public sector and then private sectors are also uh, utilizing this market to deploy the money to uh, sustainable finance. Uh, this is, uh, those are the principles set by uh, ICMA. Uh, most of the ESG transactions, like 1980% uh, of the bonds, are uh, uh, aligned with bond principles set by ICMA. I'm so proud of that. I, to I talked about the issuer side, but also investors are growing in interest, being interested in sustainable finance. Looking at this chart, the growth of flow funds uh, can be seen, and then also even under the uh, current tough situation, still sustainable finance uh, investment is more uh, featured than conventional investment. Hot topics. ESG was uh, basically, uh, originally, it was featured to improve environment and then also uh, to improve social issues. But these days, it's more political matters, to be honest. And then uh, last year, uh, US uh, introduced the uh, Inflationary Inflation Reduction Act and then also EU. Uh, implemented the power EU impact. As highlighted in yellow, uh, ESG is related to energy security as well. So it's getting more political, but, but still uh, there are so many uh, issues to be solved, but uh, these are the uh, current uh, phenomena. And then interestingly, uh, EU, uh, EU taxonomy, maybe you don't know about EU taxonomy, but it's a category which is sustainable and not sustainable. And then uh, recently, uh, EU included nuclear and gas as sustainable uh, energy. And then there are still a lot of uh, uh, controversial discussion in the market participants, but this has been recently implemented. And then also greenwashing. Uh, since the market has grown so rapidly, there are so many transactions which are not green. For example, very interesting example, there was a green transaction for uh, trains. Trains are regarded as uh, uh, environmentally friendly uh, because uh, they are using electric ut uh, electricity, but they brought calls on trains. It's a great, a big, a good example of greenwashing. And then the SEC recently investigated uh, our peers, and then they, uh, they, 
that some peers uh, paid some penalties and greenwashing, social washing, uh, the hot topics in the market. And in order to avoid this, we have to make more uh, transparent disclosure and then uh, investors and financial institutions should be careful uh, what we're doing in a uh, where, whether we are doing in an appropriate manner. Japan, what are we doing? Where to go? Japan, uh, we are uh, one of the uh, countries which will be affected by the recent geopolitical tension. Why? Uh, Japan primary energy self-efficiency ratio is the lowest among G7 countries. Look at the number. Uh, Japan uh, in uh, self-sufficiency ratio is just 11%. So we have to find out the way how to be independent uh, from uh, on uh, energy resources. As you know, the uh, ex-Prime Minister Suga uh, declared uh, carbon net zero by 2050, and then since then, uh, there are several working groups set up to achieve this net zero. And then I have been uh, a, members, a member of several uh, working groups, and we are still working on uh, many issues. Uh, one interesting topic, uh, last year, uh, no, the two years ago already, uh, corporate governance code was revised. And one of the topic is that the sustainability and then ESG elements should be uh, included in our corporate disclosure. And the second one, it's also interesting. Uh, it, it says that we have to promote diversity. Diversity and inclusion is one of the important topic for Japanese uh, society. And then Japanese corporates is are now supposed to uh, disclose what we are doing to promote diversity and an inclusion, not only female, but also uh, non-Japanese people and so on. Hopefully, uh, this will uh, accelerate uh, the diversity and inclusion situation in Japan. Another one, uh, I, I've just touched upon uh, energy uh, issues in Japan. Japan uh, is heavily reliant on fossil fuel uh, energy. And then in, in Europe, the choice is just renewable. But can we do that in Japan? We have so many utility companies or energy companies or steel companies, uh, manufacturing companies. So we need to transform those business to be decarbonized in a gradual manner. Look at the, uh, the, 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 the cover page of the handbook set by uh, ministries, uh, METI, uh, Ministry of Environment, and then the FSA. The goal is high. We have to go to the uh, uh, summit by various uh, manners. And then in order to promote this, uh, we set the handbook to promote climate transition. And then thanks to that, uh, already we have seen some initiatives by Japan Airline, JERA, Tokyo Gas, uh, uh, Kawasaki Line, and, and then so on to, uh, to, to change their business by utilizing uh, uh, capital markets. And then also Mr. Kishida uh, announced that they are going to do green transition bond in 2023 at the earliest time. And then we need uh, 150 trillion yen to promote uh, this uh, initiative in 10 years. Uh, final part. COP15, uh, uh, Gretchen is going to talk about nature uh, importance, but uh, in the November last year, we had COP15 uh, to talk about uh, uh, biodiversity. This is another uh, topic uh, in ESG area. And then five takeaways here. Uh, there are several takeaways, but I like to uh, call out that Number one, nature-related risks have emerged as a material issue for companies. And number four, more data and tools to assist corporate performance in the actions on nature are becoming available. And then several other new business initiatives were launched, including, I missed putting that, but there are several initiatives that are going on. Uh, today's topic is uh, so 
social tech, and then uh, to promote the business, or in order to avoid greenwashing or social washing, we need data. We need uh, quantification of the impact. And then having those data, we can, we can have uh, more ideas to which direction we should invest. And then also we need technologies to promote decarbonization like uh, carbon uh, capture technologies or uh, CCS or other technologies to promote sustainable uh, future to pass to the ge next generation. Uh, that concludes my presentation and I'd like to hand over to Gretchen. Thank you very much. Thank you. So next is uh, um, Professor Gretchen Derry's presentation. Thank you so much, everybody. <clears throat> Can you hear just yes. well? Thank you. I'm I'm so inspired um, by all that the Japan program has done over all these years, and very honored to take part in this celebration and convening and hopefully really rich conversation today. And um, just to be clear, I'm standing because I had a back injury a couple days ago, and so sorry I'll be awkwardly at this side during our conversation. Um, <clears throat> I'm really inspired by all that Bank of America is leading, thanks to Rico's great insights and efforts, and I'd, I'd like to play off of those in um, kind of opening a conversation together with all of us here. Um, so I've been coming at the problem from where she left off, um, that more and more companies are recognizing nature-related risks as material for their operations and uh, you know, really core to the future. Um, also recognizing how much we need data and real information to help guide decision making, whether it's in investment or other um, really key decisions that we need to take across society in um, public and private sectors. So I'll give you a little bit of a um, just background on what's happening on the nature-related side of things. In the context that we're discussing today, climate is ahead in many ways as an issue. Um, there's been uh, maybe a 25-year head start by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel or Program on, on Climate Change, that has helped um, organize scientific um, and social and other research on the impacts of climate change and what we can do to mitigate those and hopefully avoid you know, the worst possible impacts. And all of that is just starting about 25 years delayed for different reasons of how academia works and how um, leadership happened to occur and things like that. But now there's tremendous momentum in this area of valuing nature and decision making and um, more and more opportunity to integrate the advances that have been made in um, decision making all across many sectors and regions of the world. So a quick overview. Um, the idea here is to uh, recognize that nature is an, a fundamental engine of prosperity. That's sort of an understatement. We couldn't live on any other known planet. And um, so it's fundamental to everything. Um, we often talk about nature in terms of natural capital. And that was by design initially. It has nothing to do with capitalism or any system like that. It just has to do with there being a stock of nature in the form of lands, waters, and all of the life that lives within our lands and waters that together provides a flow of benefits to people. So we need to keep our eye on both the stock and the flow, just like you do <laughs> in finances. Um, and one way to look at it is around the world, you know, we've seen the planet dramatically transformed. Um, and the open question is, you know, how much and where should we protect given how little you know, rainforest remains and how rapid deforestation is continuing. 
Um, second, how can we secure people and nature? What, um, you know, this seems like at one level kind of a trivial question. At another level, this is the most challenging question humanity has ever faced given the path that we're on. How can we secure both people and nature through policy, through finance, through um, you know, the way we operate and the way we think, our mindsets, our orientation? And, um, and then finally, a, a big question I'll throw out is how do we move to better metrics for guiding you know, tracking progress and guiding action. Right now, um, as everybody knows, GDP is mostly blind to nature, and we need a way of tracking not only economic performance, but also the ecological uh, performance of places on which we all depend. So how do we value nature? We started with um, very little known on this, but uh, this wonderful person that many of you might know or have known, Ken Arrow, uh, based at Stanford and working often in Sweden, that's the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, um, and across the world really opened up the Knowledge Foundation in a way that brought a lot of credibility and um, excitement and engagement in integrating what we need to value nature and then into real decision making. A bunch of countries got going by the mid 90s. Costa Rica is shown here and really stood out as making pioneering um, policy changes to harmonize people and nature. Actually said, okay, up to now we've normally valued forest only when the trees are dead, when they're cut. And that's just crazy. The main value in trees as people know well in Japan, you know, in many places, and we know in our hearts, comes from all that they do for us when living. And um, so they started paying people, literally, to conserve and restore forest. And the program was so successful, um, it's now been replicated all over the world. Another example back in those days was New York City to take, you know, a forest case and then in the heart of a big meg a big city recognizing that water security and health depended on the upstream activities of farmers and others living about 100 or 150 miles north of the city and investing in those communities to change practices in a way that would benefit everybody. So here, the cows that you see in this dairy operation are in a solar heated tent that New York City provided that keeps the cows much healthier than they would be if they were running around um, in, and, and taking shelter in the beautiful but old New England barns that are much less healthy. So it was a, it was a combined approach of um, protecting nature and protecting animals in it that we integrate into our lives um, from disease that, that could be easily transmitted to us. So there were many other cases, and the time came to try to systematize a universal approach. And that's when we launched, um, through Stanford, this natural capital project that now is a whole suite of, of partners working together to drive research innovation in how to value nature together with partners in many different sectors, so in drinking water supply, in maintaining trees across landscapes for flood control benefits, for carbon sequestration and climate security, for hydropower production, because looking at the Costa Rica picture, um, having forest provides, it's like a sponge that slowly releases water and allows you to generate hydropower or irrigation supply or drinking water year round, not only in the um, heavy rainfall months, and many other examples. Um, and with respect to data, the bottom part is this platform that provides data uh, for the world on every part of Earth's surface. Um, it's an open source, free platform. And today, 
uh, we're working primarily in the public sector with these different banks, the Asian Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, the United Nations, many different parts of it, and central banks. Um, but there's a lot of movement toward what RICO is leading, and we need to uh, merge. That's where a lot of the innovation needs to take place in connecting these systems. But right now we're connecting through the public sector banks because they have a mission of serving the public, of harmonizing people in nature. That's their kind of core mission today, and they've all pledged to focus on that mission of, for a nature positive future. So at the heart of it and where the data and platform lie is in this um, system called INVEST um, for integrated valuation of these ecosystem service benefits, the flow of benefits from nature in many different um, kind of arenas. So here I just show a few behind each one of these panels the idea is to show where and how much nature is needed to offer coastal protection, to supply clean water and energy, to achieve flood control and protection, to um, provide food on a sustainable and healthy basis, to um, enable urban cooling as we have ever um, more extreme heat events in cities. Uh, and provide climate security generally. And then I'm going to get into health as a specific example just for, for fun. But that's the aim, is where, to indicate where and how much to protect and who will benefit and how to ensure more of an inclusive, just approach. So this has been adopted in most countries. And uh, we've just recently, pointing to data again with the data availability now ever more at fine, fine scales, we've developed a version of Invest for cities, and that's now just being tested and adopted across cities. So we're working in a lot of contexts all across the world, and um, I'll give you one example. That, and this is the tricky part, where we have to connect to the decision-making of investors, say, in the banking and finance sector, all the way through to literally land stewardship. You know, what's happening is our planet staying the beautiful blue and green ball, the living system and biosphere that we're intimately a part of. So similar to the New York case, many cities worldwide depend on upstream areas for their water supply, for downstream industry, for drinking, for downstream irrigation or hydropower. And the upstream people who, um, whose activities determine whether we're getting that flow of clean, secure water year round, they live a world apart. So this is a picture from Colombia. The gentleman on, on the left lives up in a Quechua speaking region, uh, hundreds of kilometers away from the people sort of indicated in the photos on the right. And it's a matter of making that connection and designing, here I just show monetary flow, but there needs to be a suite of institutions that get built, and that's what everybody's trying to create now, to guide investments in those communities that shift their practices, harmonize what they're doing more. So that gentleman is not only producing beef and dairy products, he's also producing water security for all these downstream uses. How do we assure that? The um, first questions that come up are even, can we define which activities and where in the watershed we should invest to achieve the necessary the, you know, outcomes for water security for all? And we're talking about thousands and thousands of square kilometers of watershed in the slope of the Andes and things, so it's not an easy question to answer. But what we've developed with all of these scientists, more than you know, something like 2,000 have contributed to this um, open source platform, is a way of looking at any system, like these are a suite of watersheds. Each purple shape is a watershed, so that means any drop of water that falls within one shape goes to a common place. 
And the common place typically nowadays is a city. And we see that city at the top, Tulua, in, in um, this valley in Colombia. And <clears throat> here I'm showing the watershed where the top is the upper mountain ridge line. And we see there's an investment portfolio that comes from the software that shows you all the science that's in the software, where you would invest. We should protect on that ridge line for the most efficient, cost-effective way of achieving water security. We should reforest where we have blue. We should add trees, silvo pasture in the grasslands where we have that yellow and so on. And this approach, I'm just showing you the very surface of it, lets you map out for any place and any budget level how much improvement you expect to achieve. Um, and, and we can play it out through time. It takes time to grow trees. But um, this is the kind of approach that's being developed for many, many, many of the benefits of nature to people. And this has been adopted by the gentleman speaking there is the recently former head of the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, and the others there, that was the head of the Nature Conservancy and a gentleman high in politics in the Mexican government. And then um, myself and a partner who runs the Natural Capital Project together with many others. But they've agreed to a standardized approach and begun implementing it. And there are now 55 cities, including most of the major um, capital cities in Latin America that have adopted this approach. So it's just one little example to get your mind flowing that we need to connect the muddy ecosystems and the hard labor of the stewards out there and their livelihoods, their dignity, their appreciation in society with um, those who make investments and you know, drive water use for all the different purposes. So that's one example. Another, that was at a tiny scale. I'll say this has also been adopted at a huge scale. So across China after they, well, for a, quite a while, we've been working together about 15 years, building up to adding ecological as a core pillar to the Chinese constitution. And um, now seeing today that half of the country has been zoned just the way that small area was zoned that I showed you in Colombia for provision of the flow of benefits from a natural capital or you know, nature, the stock of nature, the healthier regenerating ecosystems. And in China, it was motivated by these primary services that I list here. And then in localities, there are often like 20 more, you know, mushroom production or medicinal plant production or all kinds of other local benefits that local people specify. But at the national scale, um, these are the primary benefits around which the country has been zoned. And in these zones, people are paid to, and that's the way of harmonizing people and nature. They receive payments to change practices in alignment with the broader needs of society, um, hopefully for a win-win. There's a huge amount of work going on to help ensure it's a win-win. And now, just this year, and I'll kind of close with this and one more thought. Um, we have um, the United Nations Global Environment Facility inviting us to scale up through many countries. We've worked in about 80 countries, but now we're trying to really build and develop capacity in sets of 15 countries at a time. So with the development banks, the Asian, Inter-American, World Bank, and African development banks, they've chosen the countries. They've agreed to finance plans that come from using this kind of natural capital approach. And it was only last week when I injured my back that we launched this um, project and um, it here, and it, it looks very exciting. All of these countries um, are different. We'll have different starting points huge amount of innovation and capacity development that is underway, but plans that will emerge and that the banks are agreeing to finance. And then I was going to get into health, but I think I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. I'll just show you briefly the, well, how much time should I, should I take? Okay, I'm going to skip ahead. It's basically 
we know in cities that there's a tremendous need for nature. There's um, most of humanity living in cities, much less time in nature and all our time really indoors and on devices. And we know there's a huge increase in anxiety and mood and other disorders that relate to depression and mental health problems. And what we found, I was gonna show that, um, I'll leave that. We did a study here showing that if you walk in a natural area nearby, you do much better than if you walk um, just along that street, El Camino. It's not a horrible mega city street, it has trees, but it's amazing. We um, had people do these funny tests where you do a math problem and remember letters. And the people who walk in that little natural area remember way more. So it's both cognitive functioning and emotional well-being go way up if you take time to experience nature and you have the luxury of being able to go out where you live and work and experience nature. So it improves all these things and there have been hundreds of studies on this now. Yeah, it also like immune function. If you look at kids, this is here in, um, in uh, Finland where there's a ton of nature, but people live in high rises. The kids go to these schools that until recently, and more and more actually, they have this gravel, no like healthy soil that the kids touch, but they run around on gravel or more and more there's ground up tires, uh, which is really sad, but it's sort of bouncy and maybe people think it's a good place to throw away ground up tires and kids can bounce. <laughs> but the people found if you take blood samples of the kids before and after this intervention of adding grass, adding that little planter box. Do you see that little, um, um, that little square in the bottom right middle is where they can plant a few vegetables or those little black things are logs from the forest. And then you take a blood sample six weeks later, their immune function has gone way up. So there are tons of studies coming out like this on many pathways, also looking at physical activity. So many pathways connecting nature experience causally with human health and the benefits of, of health, mental and physical. But finally, I'll just close on this point. We're trying to integrate all of this into a new um, metric that would go alongside GDP. And it, um, like GDP, it just sums up all the goods and services for GDP and the economy, you know, multiplying their quantity by price, basically. And in <clears throat> the whole biosphere, we're gonna um, sum up all the benefits from nature to people, all the goods and services that we get from ecosystems multiplied by their value and be able to track not only then economic performance of countries like we do with GDP, but ecological performance of, it can be countries, it could be any place. And this is really taking off. It sort of shows you, you know, where the benefits originate, how much there is and to whom they flow. And um, it's got all the data, it's a lot of uses, and it's been approved by the UN. And um, this is taking off now around the world. And I'll just close saying it's a moment really to look at uh, the work being led by Rico and, and see how can we connect across, you know, we're both working away in our different areas and it's time for all that social innovation <laughs> to enable us to connect and, um, and accelerate the transformation. That's it, thank you so much. Oops. Oh, thank you, thank you, Greta, thank for you. a great, uh, uh, very interesting research. And I think uh, the key is data and the communication between the each sector, technology and the startups to emerge, such as a satellite image and also the um, AI that can analyze the data. And I'd like to ask Reiko about uh, how you think about this uh, communication between the sectors and also initiatives 
from the uh, this kind of United Nations, the World Bank. Uh, do you think that's, that's sustainable or we need more improvement for that? So actually, uh, when I talk about the growth of a uh, green bond market, mm -hmm. uh, the trigger, one of the trigger was the United Nations uh, Paris Agreement and then mm. also SDGs. Yeah. So the initiative by the supranational and then also uh, governmental uh, initiatives are one of the triggers. And then uh, private sectors are stepping in right. the initiatives. Mm. And then so if we have a good data and then also some decision by policy makers, then uh, uh, private sectors will focus on or look at that and then also you show already some evidence how powerful, mm. for example, nature has. And then actually we, we are seeing some startups already mm. uh, talking about this in mm. Asia, for example. Mm. So things have already started. So I think that there should be some momentum going forward, mm. but we should raise our voices further going mm. forward mm. in capital markets or in financial mm. society, but also in governmental mm. area as mm. well. Mm. Great, thank you. So uh, I'd like to ask Gretchen about what do you expect from the finance or other sectors? What do you need more communication or what do you need for more framework, or more participation from other sectors? Thank you, that's a great question. <coughs> Can everybody hear okay? Yep. Um, so, Basically, what we've found is really useful. You've mm. touched on it all. It's partly developing a framework mm. that will work within a, you know, part of the private sector, right. but recognizing that we need to develop ever more of a universal mm. kind mm. of framework. So um, making that innovative step right. of coming up mm. through the Bank of America, this mm. is how we could approach this mm. uh, you know, within these frameworks that are emerging. And then um, secondly is developing actual use cases. Mm -hmm. And um, mm, use we're, case. for example, working with Morgan Stanley now mm. to um, connect uh, exactly what you were touching on, the mm. AI and the yeah. data right. um, using high resolution satellite imagery right. yeah. and asset locations. We can identify um, more and more, this is what we're advancing, mm. the dependence and the impact of any asset based on its likely activities. And with Morgan Stanley, we can mm. learn what the activities are for many thousands of assets. <clears throat> and um, this use case, it's just like a little a research demonstration, mm. Mm. a prototype that allows us to then determine the footprint of each asset of Morgan Stanley mm. across the planet in terms of its impacts, its dependencies on nature, and the risks to which it's exposed mm. to help inform all of us as to what's going on. Mm. And then there's a question going back to Rico, mm. what do you do with that information? Mm. Mm. You know, what can the investor or the holder of the asset uh, do? What are the options? And so it's kind of working together mm. and just bringing the science mm. <clears throat> um, in, in a very useful way. So being told by um, the asset managers what they need to know and try, we then try to develop mm. answers that are mm. packaged up in a very useful way so that at a large scale and rapidly they mm. can get the information needed. Mm. Uh, I have yeah, to please, add yeah. one thing. So uh, in 2021, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, G funds, Global Financial Association mm. for Net Zero, uh, G funds was G -funds. established, and then uh, maybe several hundred financial institutions have committed to achieve carbon net zero mm. by 2050. So we have started to quantify our footprint mm. in GHG emission, and and then. Probably going forward, as I discussed at COP15, we are talking about importance of biodiversity and mm. so on. So if we have some indicators or right. some milk mass mm. uh, to, to book in our portfolio, then, then probably we are going to commit something mm. 
in the near future, mm. and then financial institutions are getting more serious mm. to, in, uh, to, to make research what kind of portfolio we invest mm. in, and then that will promote our financial deployment mm. uh, to those important initiatives. Mm. Mm. That's for sure. Right, right. We are so curious mm. or <laughs> so, so serious, I would say, mm. to, to, to transform the business mm. to carbon neutrality right. in a proper manner. Mm. And then uh, our nature uh, elements will be included, I'm sure. Right, right. Yeah. I think the carbon um, decarbonization is a kind of great example for this uh, activity. So, but I think carbon uh, initiative is kind of amplified by a matrix quantifying the, 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 the effectiveness of the measure, uh, each action. But as you propose, Gretchen, as you propose GDP and GEP, do you think GEP could be quantified in the future, maybe in the near future? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. <laughs> so we have developed the methodology further and further, and it is now actually being quantified and deployed across China um, as part of it's mandated now by mm. policy, just since a couple of months um, at all levels. And some places are much farther ahead. Everything mm. is done very experimentally to see if it works before you know, mm. having everybody do it. So <clears throat> Shenzhen, the top four mm. cities are, are using this. Shenzhen is the furthest along and they track about 25 different mm. um, <clears throat> ecosystem benefits and um, they're yeah, reshaping the way decisions are made in terms of development across the city, valuation of properties and things like that mm. based on um, this approach. And now many other cities and countries really want to try this out. <clears throat> so since the United Nations Statistical Division um, certified this as part of its whole framework for valuing nature, um, we're working in Sweden, for example, across all municipalities to quantify mm. GEP. And there are a bunch of other countries. Colombia has started adopting it, sometimes in a particular mm. sector, mm. especially where this is all new for the country mm. and a lot of new systems need to be created for um, mm. really bringing this usefully in decisions. Mm. We're starting with water. The water sector is mm -hmm. core to, mm -hmm. you know, the core engine for many dimensions mm. of economic activity. Right. And um, so Colombia is starting with that. Um, we also have Mongolia wants to take it up. There are mm. many um, countries in that UN Global Environment Facility Project that want to take it up and we'll be looking for the most practical, mm. we're very practical mm. in approach right. and want to improve as we go and just test things out and allow um, adaptation to mm. local circumstances and what's most important in Sweden versus mm. Mongolia will be quite different. Mm. Mm. Do you have any specific expectation for Japan, Kyoto and Tokyo, do they have tons of the uh, example case studies? Absolutely. Um, Japan has been a huge leader in this, and Good. especially <laughs> with the Satoyama and Satoyama mm, right, initiative. Right, right. Wow. Uh, yeah. I think that's what a lot of it comes mm. down to, again, why I was emphasizing stewardship. A challenge in Japan is how the agricultural community, whether in coastal or mm. inland areas, has grown older, like me. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so... There, but there are, in my recent trips to Japan, I've met a lot of younger people mm. really inspired by this vision for a nature positive, climate secure mm. future and all the transformation, the social economic transformation that goes with it. Mm. So there, there are many um, you know, younger communities now advancing um, a whole new approach to, like um, I was in Chiba Prefecture mm. and. I think the government has mandated, the last time I was there, they had recently mandated, it was just before the pandemic, um, organic rice be served to all school children. So it was really an incentive, you know, mm. and a very visible mm. one to mm. drive a shift in rice production. Mm. And 
an understanding among all households. You know, it gets to the broader right. cultural shift that we need to make in our uh, way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And it was connected to many investments in other aspects of biodiversity and the economic um, engine that biodiversity can be mm -hmm. for tourism mm -hmm. and cultural tourism activities and things mm -hmm. that from Tokyo everybody's dying to get mm -hmm. out and, mm -hmm. and experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. there's been tremendous leadership in Japan and I think there's enormous opportunity with um, both the protection that's been mm -hmm. achieved but also the real challenges mm -hmm. that lie ahead in the mega cities. Mm -hmm. How are all those kids and workers and everyone going to have nature experience. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There needs to be some creative thinking there to right. achieve right. A, a vision like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'd like to ask this question to both of you. Both of you. Um, I downloaded the Invest software and platform to my computer and try some, some of the data. And uh, as a, so I think because I, I have some background for the programming and uh, uh, ecological uh, ecosystem. But uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to use sometimes for some people. And what do you expect for the future generation for the skills, let's say? Okay. Because your topic it includes public health or the every, I think interdisciplinary research, right? And future generation needs some skills to adapt to that. And what kind of skills do you need for okay. you? Let's say you're a lab member, or let's say a Lego, if you have, a, let's say, you're a freshman coming to your uh, department. What do you expect? In adapting the future change, change or yeah. to promote sustainable finance? What kind Both. of aspect? Both. Both. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very interestingly, uh, I, I, I meet many new grads mm. to, for interviews to join our mm. company. And the many questions are related to sustainable finance mm. because Bank of America has been very uh, proactive in that area, and then they ask us, uh, what can we do, uh, what can they do uh, in financial market mm. to, pro to contribute mm. to sustainable society? Mm. So young people are more curiosity or interest mm. in that area, but we are not charitable mm. organizations, obviously. So as a financial person, uh, of course, we need to continue growth if capitalism mm. still exists. Mm. Okay, mm. so as a banking society uh, people, of course, we need to make growth some profit. Mm. But on the other hand, we also need to keep in mind that what we are doing, and then is that good for the society, mm. Mm. or is it good mm. for nature, or is it good for sustainable mm. society? Mm. And then, so we need to have the balanced mm. um, mind. And then also, uh, we can't be Yamamoto-san, no, no. <laughs> uh, like a programmer no, no. or programming, uh, I don't know, whatever. So uh, from that regard, and, but, but, but on the other hand, there are so many advanced technology which can be usable for the elderly people like mm. myself, so we can't, we can't rely on our own skills, but our skills should be to accept the change mm. of technology, mm. or accept the change of the society, mm. adapt mm. to the so change of the society, mm. and then also imagine, imagine. what we are doing mm. in this uh, neighborhood, mm. in this society, mm. in this country, mm. and then also on this growth. So, uh, growth. In a nutshell, I, I think we need, what young people need to have mm. imagination, imagination, empathy, okay. empathy, and then curiosity. Curiosity, thank you. I think <laughs> you've said it so beautifully. And, <laughs> um, I'll try to, I agree completely mm. and share mm. your vision. And I, I'll just add a few things. Mm. One is um, that on the one hand, there will always be like you're saying, a lot of technical mm. expertise required to manipulate some of the tools or take some approaches. Mm. We can lower the barriers um, to that, and that's mm. we're aiming to move invest from more of a research grade right. um, system mm. to something that will have a friendly user interface for many different types of users. 
Um, and we're starting that in partnership with a team in Stockholm, actually, working in the financial sector. Um, but I think more broadly, building on the nice points you've just both made, it's um, a matter of cultivating a collective mindset and taking a more collectivistic rather than individualistic um, orientation to our lives and our purpose and um, their beautiful cultures that do have more of that collective approach. And we, we can cultivate that a lot more widely, mm. especially in young people. Mm. Um, and the empathy that goes mm. with that, the, mm. the type of understanding in a, um, of one another that I've seen, I have two teenagers and I'm amazed at how little education they get in the education system here on really key topics mm. <laughs> to do with um, understanding why society looks the way it does mm. today. Uh, a lot of that history is not taught or is even actively being suppressed um, today. And um, at the same time, um, one other remark and building off again what you both have been saying is we need to be able to envision a lifetime of learning um, that we don't just master a few skills when we're in our 20s or something and then we're just going to hammer away with those particular tools and skills the rest of our lives. We've got to be really flexible and adaptable and um, and have that curiosity and also an ability to continue advancing our skills as we go along in partnership with others that bring other skills that we might never have. Mm. Working in teams that are less siloed by skills. Here, if you walk around the campus, it's very much divided by skills. Mm -hmm. Mm. You know, and I, mm. I work in the biology building and you're supposed to just focus <laughs> on biology there. Mm. But you know, we need to be interacting with people mm. in finance right. and social sciences of all sorts, in history and human, the many aspects of human development. And so we are seeing more and more in the university education system, not in, in the system leading up to university, mm. unfortunately. But within universities, there are more programs where the extra curious students can mm get together in an interdisciplinary way and focus more on issues that they care about and, um, mm. and learn skills. It doesn't mean not having deep skills, but mm. it means right. mixing it up much more. Mm. What do you think about uh, John Doerr's sustainability uh, school, which launched last year, I think uh, recently? I think it's a great example mm. of formalizing many efforts that have been underway mm. here and all over the world in trying to drive this shift, uh, recognizing that um, there is a lot of curiosity mm. driven and also problem oriented research that needs to be advanced. And the only way really to um, advance solutions mm. is in partnership mm. with people who would implement, <laughs> mm. who need, you know, who need to help make the solutions, you know, activate them and, and such. So, uh, I hope, so far the new school is extremely mm. new and it's hard to know exactly what it will mm. become, but I hope very much and I think it's likely that the focus will be on engagement mm. with experts all over society, whether it's the gentleman in the Andes whose mm. farming mm. practices affect everybody's water security mm. or um, someone living, you know, in the heart of private finance, mm. we, we need to be connected more and more and um, understand how to deploy all the resources mm. of a place, especially like this door mm. school, mm. for real impact mm. and not just, you know, university exercises. Mm. Mm. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you for great uh, uh, input. I'd like to uh, open the floor to the questions from audience. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, please raise your hand and uh, Mike will be Yes, please. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. My name is Hiro Otaki, and actually, 
That's from School of Medicine. I, was gra I graduated uh, inform clinical informatics management last year. And then my question is, you know, I, I don't know much about social tech, but I really understand your macro approach from Reiko and then, you know, the project-based approach from the Professor Davey, the pronunciation correct? Sure, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, and then my, the moderator, Mr. Yasu, Mr. Yasu told me, talk about the data things. But my question is, here, it, it's uh, Stanford. So we want to know about the unmet needs, about data collection and then data analysis from macro, macro point of view, mm -hmm. as well as a project-based point of view. I assume which happens in medical field as well. Mm. You know, that project-based performance indicator, you know, the, the quality of data and then also subset of data varies from each project. And then how to, you know, collect those, you know, different data and then integrate into the macro, you know, the measures. So that may be some, you know, the unmet needs, huge unmet need over there. So mm -hmm. could you explain about a little bit more? Maybe already, you know, some startup exists to fill those gap. But mm -hmm. if you have some example, and then this is a, like unmet needs, mm -hmm. you know, this is a place for mm -hmm. like a startup opportunity or mm -hmm. something like that things from your side, the project-based side, and then also the macro side. Thank you. Okay, you've hit on, you know, a gold mine potentially. <laughs> it's also a, a huge barrier right now, just as you say. So within the Natural Capital Project, we have um, compiled global environmental data, and we're bringing in ever more social, economic, and health, and other such data. But it's just as you say, the, that's pretty coarse scale. It was only recently we could bring in the fine scale meter by meter data needed for cities. Mm. And um, every time someone compiles a new data layer, so to speak, that has a huge impact. An example that I'll give you that then emerged into a company is forest cover data. Going back to the beginning, mm. trees really are not only trees, all the, all the systems, the coral reefs, the grasslands, the grazing lands, the shrublands are important. But just to talk about trees, since we all can easily uh, relate to trees, um, before the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement, there was a massive effort to get data on every tree across the world, and then mainly focused in the tropics, because there wasn't time and resources. But I know some of the teams that worked on that, and. Um, it was a really inspiring project. It was tremendously successful. They got a huge amount of information and they advanced technology so that, for example, in the country of Peru, which they picked because it's so diverse, has some of the wettest in the heart of the Amazon, the headwaters of the Amazon, and some of the driest in the Atacama Desert along the coast ecosystems. They um, mapped every single tree for Peru, and they measured using this hyperspectral sensor Ooh. flown on an airplane that flew at very low elevation. It was quite dangerous, and the team, thankfully, is all still alive, wow. and one of them came and became my student after Ooh. flying that plane for seven years. Wow. With the hyperspectral <laughs> sensor, they, they measured every aspect they could of the health and nutrition and um, hydration of the trees and how likely they were to live. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of drought going on in the Amazon and that kind of thing. Um, and that then, it, it really supported um, agreement around the climate accord that was a, a major step. And it led to a small company called Salo.ai, mm -hmm. S-A-L-O.ai that you could look up. And it's, it's I think it's called the forest inventory, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that supported the state of California and PG&E. So it was the health of every tree in California mm -hmm. and the ignition risk. After, you know, it's evident that a lot of the fires we're experiencing here are triggered by these accidental ignitions um, through, uh, you know, our energy system. Um, so that was extremely useful. 
And now um, it's just been bought up by Planet, that company, about a month ago. But there, I could give many other examples, but you're right on it. There's a lot happening in um, like wearables for health mm -hmm. metrics to touch on your medical um, context. And we're running even um, RCTs, randomized controlled trials with healthcare providers. Right. And it's again a, a, like a demonstration project, but to show we're looking at communities that have more and less aspect, um, access to nature. We're trying to quantify the return on investment on the part of a medical, um, you know, um, a health provider, the return mm -hmm. on investment in promoting nature prescriptions and programs and other kinds of investment so that people have more access to nature. So there's a ton going on and basically every data layer needs improvement and, um, and there's scope, I think, for a lot of um, innovative startups. So uh, as financial industries, there are several ways uh, already to work with data providers. Uh, one of the ways is to work together. So we work together with uh, academia, NGOs, or startups to promote or to, to make some research and so on. And then also we are hiring experts uh, to our company to work together internally. And, and then also if we think that, oh, these startups make some fortune, then we invest in. So there are several ways for uh, private sectors to work with uh, these uh, new initiatives provided by academia or new, uh, new NGOs and so on. So we, we fully understand that we can't do anything alone and then we need knowledge, expertise, or uh, initiatives from the other sectors. And then collaboration is really important. And also we work together with uh, government as well. So across the sectors, across private sectors and public sectors, across the regions, uh, all the collaborations are really important to promote, uh, to analyze data and then utilize that data to, to make things happen. Thank you. Yeah, so I assume that you know, in the corporate security, there's some accounting rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, accounting yeah, so rules account are also. Green, green yeah. accounting rules. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> already, already started. Yeah, ISSB will be launched. Will be launched this year. Uh, uh, in the past, uh, financial data or financial disclosures was internationalized. Uh, IFAS, you you may know, and then IFAS, uh, IFAS Foundation set up uh, ISSB. I don't know the abbreviation uh, details, but uh, uh, global uh, standard for. Uh, mm climate-related right. disclosure mm. has already started, and that will be mandatory going forward in the major countries, including Japan. So uh, accounting rules have already mm. uh, under uh, preparation, and that will change further. But what kind of elements to be on mm. accounting, it's still under discussion, and then maybe new items will be added going mm. forward. Ideal if the corporate accounting comes into the project. Mm. But, uh, this is the water project needed. This kind of uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it should be. The, the it should be. Yeah, project, right. We have to have this major or something. Like that. Yeah, the details will be discussed further. But uh, like financial disclosure, uh, yeah, that's a national account point, right? So going. Yeah, yeah, I do, know. but uh, the data, uh, but but in order to be narrative, we need some description or narrative. But uh, ISSB has just started, just and then that will be discussed further, working together with maybe yeah, so, mm. uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Professor uh, yeah. Professor Daly. But uh, that has mm. just started. Mm. Right. Thank you. Yeah, that could read. That, that could read to uh, G G E A G D P G G E P G P. Yeah. That's great. I was, uh, we have uh, two minutes to rest, but uh, maybe one last, last quick question from audience. If not, oh yes, please. Thank you. I'll try and keep this short. Michael Beeman with APARC. Um, 
my sense is that in order to reach the, the qualify, qualifying um, mm. criteria for green bonds, it requires a substantial carbon mm. shift in a project of some sort. Japan, of course, is um, wonderfully famous for um, maybe a slower, in a sense, a slower shift so far, mm. but rather kind of squeezing out energy efficiency mm. in every possible way, mm. be it dark hallways, be it you know, appliances, be it et cetera. Mm. So uh, I guess my question is how, what is the interplay between energy efficiency as a goal of what the kinds of projects you're trying to finance? Can, can those even have a chance to qualify for green bonds in a general sense? Or, and if not, um, is, this, is there a place for Japan's contribution to find kind of a new way of measuring and, and marketing bonds that do support more focus on energy efficiency as opposed to energy transition? Uh, both. Uh, so if you look at the recent report by the government, they are going to focus, first of all, renewable energy. But uh, Japan has been leading uh, energy efficiency as well, so they promote energy efficiency as well. But in order to achieve carbon net zero by 2050, we have to do everything because we are so heavily relying on fossil fuel. And in order to be decarbonized, not only uh, energy efficiency, but all measures, maybe including uh, nuclear power, should be also promoted going forward. So all that measures should be taken. I don't know how it goes, <laughs> but that, that is the official, official announcement by the government. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much for a great session. Okay. Uh, please give the, uh, give the work a warm hand. Thank you. Right. Thank you.